So good morning, everyone. Um, so first of all, let me thank the organizers for the, the invitation. That's really uh, great to be here today and sh share with you actually a, a bit of our view on how we can use all what we have learned today with Patrick. And uh, actually, that was really helpful for uh, speeding up on some of my slides. Uh, on, uh, on the genome editing technologies, and also I would like to introduce a bit of uh, epigenome editing technology. So how can we use this, uh, these new techniques um, more into the, into the clinics and how can we apply them to, to patients? And our focus is mostly chronic and acquired immune deficiencies. Um, and I would like also to open some uh, little point of discussion and, and see and uh, let's say share with you um, our view on that. Uh, so let me uh, start with this very briefly. You have uh, already uh, learned what does genome editing mean, genome engineering means. It, uh, it's just uh, the, 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 the ability to uh, precisely modify a genome. And when I mean precisely, you really uh, sometimes aim at create nucleotide um, changes in a, in a huge genome like the human one. And the reason uh, of doing that, it can be uh, really uh, different. You can uh, need um, some uh, gene editing for, uh, for basic research, so to, to create, for example, animal models, cellular models. Um, and that's basically what has been done for years in reverse genetics to study gene function. But uh, a, a, very, a very, very large field is today, especially with the, the, with the, the, the discovery of CRISPR, is how to use this, uh, these technologies here in biotechnologies to create, for example, bioreactors. Um, on, on the other side, what we are interested in is to really apply this principle here to, uh, in, into human medicine for human care. And what we are focusing, as I mentioned to you before, is mostly HIV infection, focus on my lab, and, and primary immune deficiency, which uh, we will see in a minute. Um, fortunately, I can go fast here. So the, the, all what, uh, what you have learned already is what you have to do uh, is induce a, a DNA double strand break as close as, pro as possible to the, 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 the location where you want to induce the genetic change in the genome. This will learn as some DNA repair pathway which the cell has developed to, to overcome the DNA breaks which uh, occur naturally uh, during the day. Um, and the most uh, active one is the normal and joining which is a fast mechanism. It's, it, it's not so precise, it's error prone, and it will lead uh, to the, the introduction at the double strand break of few insertion or deletion uh, of a, mut a mutation, which uh, if this occurs in a gene, we can harness all these into gene therapy to induce gene disruption. And we will see in a minute why we want to do that in a from a clinical point of view, but that's what is important. We can get rid of a function of a gene which we don't want. Um, ideally, we can also do this in a more broad way, we can delete chromosomal portions if we induce double strand break in the close proximity, as shown here, uh, and as also uh, Patrick mentioned. Um, what is more tricky, but also what is more interesting in the field, is how we can get precise genome editing. So how we can really change precisely a genomic location. And this can be used, for example, in the clinic when we, we need, for example, a gene function which is missed. We have a recessive mutation, so we have a patient which doesn't have a certain gene function, what we can uh, aim for is to precisely integrate now this cDNA coding for the missing gene into a very specific location in the genome, what is so-called uh, safe harbor, for example. Uh, or in alternative, as already Patrick showed to you, we can also aim at correcting specific mutation without doing any other change into the genome, and so this goes under the name of gene correction. Uh, so mostly through uh, my talk, we, I will focus on gene disruption, which is obviously the, the most uh, let's call it easy way to, to perform gene editing, and that's also what is more advanced into the, into the clinic, and uh, we will see it in a minute. So these are the technologies out that you can use. We have learned a lot about zinc fingers, so there are also meganucleases and tail nucleases, and we see today a lot of CRISPR, um, so uh, uh, RNA-guided nucleases. The, the, the main principle is that you always have a DNA binding moiety. In this case, it's a protein portion, it's a DNA binding motif. Uh, based on zinc fingers, in this case on tails. In the case of the CRISPR, as you have seen already, is an RNA molecule which dictates the binding of the Cas9 to the target site. And then you have a nuclease, which in this case here is, uh, uh, let's say, a, um, a portion of a restriction enzyme, is a FOC1, um, which dimerizes at the target site and induces a double strand break. In this case, the function of nuclease is given directly from, from the Cas9 protein, and in the meganuclease, the cleavage function is embedded in the, in the protein structure. 
Um, so we would focus mostly on Talon and, and, uh, and, um, um, and CRISPR-Cas9 during the, the talk. And I would like to start now from a, a point of view of application. So what we are trying to do in the lab uh, and just to open some of the question on how we can use these technologies, so these CRISPR, um, CRISPR technologies, in order to treat something like this. So in this case, we have a primary immune deficiency, which is uh, in most of the cases due to stas 3 mutations. And uh, we are particularly interested in autosomal dominant forms because I think this, uh, this is a, a, a very tricky situation to, 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 to deal with with the patients. So the, 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 the problem in the patients is mostly a, a, a lack of uh, functional T cells, and so the, the, these patients that cannot really um, get along with infections. Um, and the, the problem in this case is that they are not too bad to be, sub, so let's say, to be um, suggested an hematopoietic stem cell transplantation. So these are the different mutations that we find in the patients. So these are patients that we have in Freiburg. As you can see, there are hot spots of mutations. So there are really many mutations with pen all over the gene. And as we have learned from uh, Patrick, a way to, to correct this kind of mutation is to introduce a super exon as much as possible in a, one of the first introns in order to, to treat all the possible mutations which are downstream um, of the insertion site. The other way, since this is an autosomal dominant, this means that you still have another, another allele which is good. Uh, and so just think about that. Um, so the, 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 the normal situation in, 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 in this, um, in, in, let's say, in, 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 in humans actually is that the STAT3 has to dimerize. And uh, this happens up after the activation of the pathway, after the, the, the JAK uh, kinase activation, which phosphorylates STAT3. And the, the functional dimers translocates into the nucleus and, um, let's say, regulate transcription of target genes. Um, in, in case of hyper IgE syndrome, when you have uh, an allele which uh, codes for a, an uh, autosomal dominant STAT3, then this takes over in 75% of the dimers. So we end up only having 25% of uh, normal STAT3 dimers, and this is, of course, not enough to, to give a normal phenotype, and that translates into an hyper IgE syndrome. And as I mentioned to you, um, most of these people are not too bad, so they take antibiotics, but this is a, a long, on long term, it's a quite dramatic situation which they have to leave and so the <coughs> but still let's say the risk associated the risk associated with the, um, um, let's say heterologous stem cell transplantation is still too high and so that's why we thought about uh, what we can do for these patients can we maybe create generate a protocol uh, to, uh, to let's say to uh, create autologous stem cell transplantation so which uh, which means uh, their own stem cells which are corrected and then give, you know, given them back um, our correction strategy, as you may imagine, um, is just to um, inactivate now the mutant uh, allele, so to make a kind of allele-specific targeting. And of course, um, our main goal here was mostly to see the potential of the CRISPR technologies in making this kind of, uh, of targeting, in being precise enough to discriminate between two very similar alleles. And so uh, to, to see uh, exactly the, the potential of CRISPR, we selected different kind of mutations. So on one, on one side, we wanted to treat as much patient as possible. So we selected the top mutations, uh, which, uh, let's say, occur in about 50% of the patients. And of course, we tried to diversify the mutation. So we considered deletions. Uh, in this case, it's uh, an amino acid deletion. So it's a three nucleotide deletion. We considered two point mutations here. Another point mutation is here. And the duplication of three amino acids. So which uh, let us uh, explore uh, a little specific targeting for different situations here, as you can see. Um, to select, or let's say, to, um, to, uh, to assess the activity, the allele specificity of this, um, uh, of this CRISPR, uh, we um, established this uh, episomal uh, system in which we have, actually these are all plasmid-based, so we have uh, a STAT3 sequence cDNA, which contains all the five mutations that we want to treat, uh, fused to a, a green reporter, and then we have the normal STAT3 fused to a red reporter, and then this is just to normalize the cell. So what we do, we co-transfect these three plasmids here together with the Cas9 plasmid, the guide RNA plasmids into T cell, you know, Hector 93 cells. And then by flow cytometry, we just look at, um, at allele-specific targeting. And of course, what we expect is that the green cells go down because these are linked to the mutated STAT3, and the red cells remains uh, the same. Of course, you cannot just do this kind of experiment right away, so de design guide RNA and it will work, but we had to do a lot of fine tuning of the guide RNA, and we thought about uh, play around with the length of the space around the guide RNA, with the scaffold, and with the uh, binding energy with which the guide RNA binds to the target site in order to achieve this allele discrimination. 
So I'm just showing you how here the most easy mutation. So obviously, if you have very huge differences between the two alleles, in this case, for example, is a, a duplication of three amino acids means nine, nine nucleotides uh, addition. So this is a very easy situation to discriminate. And indeed, actually, the most of the guide RNA were, uh, which we designed were working. Here is just a selection of them. Actually, the number one which we designed worked beautifully, so uh, destroying completely GFP, but no effect on the red. And if we used an alternative scaffold, which was published a couple of years ago, we even were able to better discriminate between the two alleles. So this is the easy situation. This is uh, a little bit more tricky because it's only three nucleotides difference, which are already in the range of, uh, uh, of targeting of, um, uh, let's say, in the range of tolerance of CRISPR. But still, we, we did um, identify several guide RNA, which we were able to discriminate between red and green reporter. Uh, we used, in this case, a shorter um, guide RNA, which improved a bit the situation. And again, all the, the, the alternative scaffold matched with this number one here uh, gave us the best result. So, uh, you can achieve very easily allele specificity if your alleles are very different, like in this case. So what about um, point mutations, which is, of course, probably what you might be more interested in? So here are two of the three examples that we had. So for one, we still are working on. Uh, seems very, a very tricky sequence to, to, to target. So we have here a G2A change. Uh, and we had to design several guide RNA, but we could be quite uh, happy with one of these, which gave us a, a pretty decent discrimination between the two alleles. I mean, here we are also in a situation in which we have abundance of, uh, of alleles, let's say, because we have plasmid transfection. So we thought that maybe this is enough to discriminate in a genome level when we have only two copies of the, these alleles. So we, we stopped with that here. But in this case, the situation was much worse in this mutation here as a C2T. We designed many guide RNA, but most of them were targeting also the, the wild type or the normal sequence means here the red. So we decided to destabilize this uh, short or long guide RNA by introducing additional mismatches in the guide RNA. And so we started from the mutation site, which is zero, and then we went uh, left and right plus minus one, and we had added additional uh, mismatches to the guide RNA. And as you can see, some of these additional mismatches completely destroyed the activity of the guide RNA, so we didn't see any more any, any cut uh, on both reporters. But if we are far away from the mutation, at least on one side, uh, we could really help in discriminating um, the, the, between the two alleles. So now we, we, we reach the situation in which the, the, the normal reporter is untargeted and the, 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 the mutated reporter was efficient with it. Um, of course, the, the, the question now was, can we translate this into the, the genomic situation, into the genomic log? So what we did was to integrate now the, mutation, the mutated reporter, so the EGFP reporter in the cell line um, using an antiviral approach. And then we did transfection, and as you uh, already heard today, we, uh, we did the T71 assay to monitor for on-target uh, indel uh, introduction. Uh, so this is now the endogenous STAT3. So of course, these cells are, um, they do contain endogenous uh, STAT3 sequence. So uh, they contain three alleles, actually. And uh, as you can see, these arrows here show the expected cleavage band uh, after T71, uh, assay, uh, T71 cleavage. And we didn't see, at least via T7, any cleavage, except for this one here, which was supposed to, to cut both, uh, both alleles. It was a kind of positive control for us. And already here, you can appreciate that if we use this gather in A1 and we shorten it as, uh, as it was published by Keith Chung, you abolish almost completely targeting at the, at, the, at the genomic level. And this was a shortening of two base pairs here, if I remember correctly. If we look at the endogenous reporter now, which is integrated, all of those guide RNA that we selected were cleaving uh, the, 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 the target site which, with variable efficiency from 12 up to 40%. So which means that you, do, you can do a little specific uh, targeting. Uh, we are looking here at a very, uh, not with a very not sensitive technique, of course. Uh, so the point is to really see what does this mean? Is this really 0% or we still keep some targeting on the normal allele, but still on, um, let's say, on, on average, we can say that we are able to discriminate quite decently between the two uh, alleles which we have here. Um, so as a, uh, just a conclusion for this, just want to draw um, your attention on the possibility that you have. So you can trick this platform to be specific enough. Uh, depends, of course, what are you aiming for. We, would, we could achieve up to 40% knockout of our reporter in cell line. Uh, we did see that short spacers sometimes have an, an, eff uh, an effect on the discrimination, but uh, it's not so much uh, something that you can generalize. 
Uh, on the other hand, we did see that this alternative scaffold published in 2013 in Cell was a better alternative for allele discrimination. And there are actually a couple more of scaffold that have been published in recent years. So maybe in your uh, in your case, it can be also mm, a, a good idea to, to, to systematically test them. So because the stability of the binding, it can make a, a huge difference. As I mentioned also here, this you, you can also play around in stabilizing the binding to the normal allele in order to help discriminating them. Um, what is now the, 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 the next step which I would like to discuss a bit with you is what already Patrick introduced to you. So the, the, the second um, focus of the lab is on HIV infection and actually what we are trying to do in this case is to, to, to mimic the natural situation. As you have heard already, HIV needs CD4 and CCR5 to enter into the cells and individuals which lack CCR5 are largely resistant to HIV infection. So what we thought about whether we can do this with gene editing. So can we artificially knock out CCR5 in cells from patient and then give these cells back to the patient as a therapy? <coughs> So this has been already done uh, using zinc fingers and has already reached the clinics. Uh, I will just shortly summarize the results of this first clinical trial. In this case, we had 12 patients used zinc fingers to, to knock out CCR5 in T cells. And the results are here. Actually, the, 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 the main point of the study was the safety. So you can do gene editing. You can take out the cells from a patient. You can modify them ex vivo, give them back. And the patients are fine. They didn't, uh, they, they didn't um, see any adverse event. Of course, the, the results in this case were uh, controversial. Only in few patients, they did see a benefit in viral load um, and, um, and a, a kind of selection uh, in vivo selection, advantage, uh, select, uh, selective advantage of modified cells could be seen, meaning that modified cells survived longer in the presence of the virus in vivo. Um, I just highlighted these two words here, efficiency and specificity, which I think are really the, the major point here. So one of the, 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 the drawback here was the efficiency, the, the zinc fingers that they were used they didn't show high, uh, high enough efficiency to, to modify CCR5 in most of the cells. And of course, if you induce, uh, let's say, if you just knock out one allele, of course, the cell is still susceptible to HIV and can still die. So you really want to have high efficiency means high double uh, knockout, so double allele knockout. And the other point is specificity because we already uh, learned before and we have published a few years ago that uh, zinc fingers uh, can induce uh, quite a bit of off-target cleavage. And actually this is just what we published a few years ago. I just want to draw your attention on these numbers here. So these are predicted off-targets that we measured by deep sequencing. And uh, what we, we, we could see is that if we use zinc fingers, we actually have a non-target event every two off-target events. So these are pretty bad, uh, let's say, zinc fingers. Uh, which you can see here also from the numbers. While when we use talents, and that was uh, our um, talents that we generated in our lab, we could really change this number back to uh, having much more off -target, uh, on target event over off targets. Um, if we are now ready uh, to translate this in the clinic, of course, that's a different question. And I think uh, I, won't I would really to, to, to expand now on these. So we, we can achieve high knockout efficiency. It looks like talents are well tolerated by the, uh, by the cells. Uh, seems that they are very specific, but what does really knockout means now? Um, so I think what um, what I want to, to to discuss with you is what you need for going towards the clinics. And so um, it's very important to have a good nucleus, as we have uh, as we have said many times, because you need high on target activity, but you want to limit the off target activity because you want to maintain the cell as healthy as possible. And of course, you need very good protocols to make this um, happen in, the, in, a, in, a, in a human setting. And so we have this, the described now a, GFP, a GMP compliant uh, protocol to deliver nucleases into T cells and CD34 cells, which is uh, mostly based on delivering uh, mRNA, so um, designer nucleases as uh, mRNA in vitro transcribed and nucleofact either T, or, uh, T cells or stem cells. The efficiency is pretty high, it's shown here with the GFP. MRNA, so we have about 90% efficiency. Uh, cells are, uh, are, are good, they're viable, and they can uh, be uh, cultured uh, without any problem. Can we, of course, transplant? That's the next, uh, the next step. Uh, in terms of efficiency, what we can achieve, I think we are at a very good step now. Uh, since um, in both systems that we are uh, considering, 
uh, if we look at the CCR5 knockout efficiency that we can achieve upon uh, mRNA delivery of the designer nuclease, in this case is talents, uh, we, can see the, uh, we can see here with the, uh, in T cells we can reach up to 60% uh, CCR5 knockout or let's say CCR5 uh, specific indel formation and this is calculated via deep sequencing and up to 90 percent in CD34. So these are really uh, impressive numbers. But what now does this really mean? Is this a real knockout? And I think here now comes the question. So we can be very efficient but we cannot really control the DNA repair in the cells. And what you see here, these are the top deletions that we, find by, uh, we found by deep sequencing. And if we look now, the first question, the first thing that uh, just comes to your eyes, I'm sure, if you look at the two, the two cell lines here, the, the, the top deletions are different. So you have now the same nuclease in two different uh, settings, you have different repairs already. Um, and what is more important is, as you see here, the, the top the, the top deletion in CD34 positive cells, for example, which occurred about 25% of the times, was just an in-frame deletion of three amino acids. Now, is this a real knockout? We don't know what happens at the, the protein level. We don't know what happens uh, at the HIV level, whether the HIV is really not able to enter anymore to the cells. So this just opened new questions. So what, what we need is to, to really prove that what we are doing at the cells, it maintains the cell viable and it really gives protection to the cells. I think these are really now a uh, major question in the field, so it's not enough anymore to, to talk about knockout efficiency uh, unless you really prove a knockout at the protein level. Based on this, actually, we thought about also to, to change a bit um, the, the approach, and uh, this is a very basic schematic. So what, what you have here is from the DNA to the protein, uh, a little bit of, uh, of, of things happening. Uh, and when you do genome editing, you know that you act at the DNA level, you induce some mutation here, but you hope that you have an effect. You hope that you have an effect maybe at the mRNA level, nonsense mediated decay, stop premature stop codon and decay of the messenger, or maybe you have a truncated protein. But have you, as, you, as I showed you before, it may be that you have just uh, a, uh, let's say a, a new protein which lacks a few amino acids, it may be an autosomal dominant protein, so we have to be careful about this. Um, so what we thought about doing something different is using epigenome editing, uh, which acts at the same at the DNA level here, but the effect is immediate, is at the transcription level. So all you have of, uh, let's say, silencing, or you don't have, so it's a more predictable effect, it's less invasive because you don't really change the DNA, and it can be uh, reversible. So we believe that there's a bit, in terms of safety, it might be a bit better. Um, and for these, what we are actually using at the moment is uh, a tail-based platform in which we fuse the tail DNA binding domain to a, a bunch of different uh, epigenetic effectors to, to really achieve gene silencing. And uh, I will spend the last couple of slides to show you our preliminary data on that. Um, so what we have done here, again, to prove the activity of these epigenetic modifiers, we have created a reporter cell line in which we placed actually the CCR5 promoter upstream of a minimal CMV promoter and the GFP gene and integrated this construct in the cells so that the cells appear green, as you can see here, controlled by the CMV. But when we uh, deliver uh, the epigenetic modifiers in form of mRNA, which will be the same delivery method in T cells, uh, we can shut down, actually shut off completely GFP in 80% of the cells. Uh, the question is, is this enough? Is this uh, sustained? And of course, we followed these cells uh, for a long time. This, I mean, we have data up to two months. And as you can see here, these are the negative control, means the inactive, the same molecule here, but with the mutation which render it inactive. We can keep these 80% of cells in culture, which are GFP negative now, for a long time. Uh, so this really shows that you, you have an effect which is long-term and it's stable. Uh, is this really DNA methylation, of course, was the next step. We could show this in an, in an indirect way. So what we did was to sort out these negative cells here and try to reactivate GFP expression. So we did this with the tail activator. So we fused the VP64. In this case, it's a transit activation. So we did transfection. And as you can see, after two days, you do see GFP positive cells. But after six days, the plasmid is gone. The GFP cells are gone. But if you use a DNA demethylating, uh, the demethylating agent, the uh, AZA, at a certain concentration here, you see that the effect is sustained. And actually, it's increasing over culturing because the agent is always there present. So we could show that this is really due to DNA methylation, as our aim is. Um, and we also looked at the bisulfite sequencing to, 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 to look at the extent of uh, CG methylation. 
And as you can see here in this location, in the CMV promoter, we have a lot of CG nucleotides and most of them were methylated when we used the uh, epigenetic modifiers, up to 70%. Uh, and we also looked at how fast is this kinetic. So if we look at day two after transfection and day, day six, actually at day two after transfection, uh, both upstream here is the CCR5 promoter, some CGs which are here and here are some CGs in the GFP and here is the minimal CMV portion. At day two, which is always the first block here, we always uh, measured about 40 to 60 percent already methylation. So it means that kinetics is pretty, is pretty fast. The whole machinery of uh, silencing recruited very fast at the target site. Also considering that uh, the, the epigenetic modifiers are delivered as an mRNA, so they are around for just a few hours. So this was a very, uh, very, uh, very, um, let's say, promising um, tool to, to test in T cells. And so we just applied the same thing now in primary T cells, nucleofaction of mRNA, nucleofaction was monitored by, G by a GFP. Um, and also we could actually look uh, at CCR5 expression by qPCR. And as you can see here, we could achieve up to about 50, 55 percent uh, reduction in the transcript level of CCR5. So this is done already two weeks post transfection. We cannot keep T cells in capture longer than that. We are working on, uh, on this to see how long uh, we can monitor this. Um, but of course, after DNA, uh, RNA delivery in primary T cells, still the, 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 the epigenetic factors is expressed maybe for, uh, for about 20 hours, but no more. So this is already a kind of long-term effect. And we are looking now what happens into these cells. Are they really methylated uh, at the target site? How much this methylation extends. Um, so with this I would like just to conclude and summarize what I showed you. Um, I tried to, to keep on the, on the technology part showing the different technologies that we have available, what you can do with, the, uh, with, with, with them. Um, so just giving you a bit of, um, of uh, information how you can trick the, 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 the CRISPR to be uh, very, uh, very specific and discriminate between very similar sites. Uh, of course, our next step is to validate the, the, this data in primary cells and look at off-targeting, which is always uh, a very important question. Talents and uh, epigenetic modifiers as well. Uh, our most, uh, let's say, um, urgent need is, of course, to generate now HIV-resistant T cells and provide the safety of these uh, epigenetic modifiers. And with, the, with this in hands, we really would like to, to, to open an HIV trial less, uh, as similar as has been done at the UPenn uh, to treat patients in Germany, HIV patients in Germany. So with this, thank you very much for your attention. Mm -hmm.